they come together with 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 money, with uh, good wishes, and uh, all kind of supports uh, for you to make this these dreams come true. And um, uh, after these expeditions, or uh, even like during these expeditions, I have been giving a lot of talks. Uh, to the children, to the uh, schools and colleges, and a lot of in, at a lot of uh, events, um, because uh, you know there there is a there is a thing that I loved the mountain at the first uh, visit. You know, like when I was going you know, when I went to Annapurna Base Camp, I looked at the mountain. I said, okay, I need to climb this, and that was my like like you know first like love at first sight thing. You know. But at the same time, mountaineering is like a spiritual journey for me. So when, when I was a child, I, I um, experienced a lot of uh, molestations. And as I grew up, and there were like a lot of uh, other kind of uh, abuses also. So as I grew up, I, I wanted to like um, know my value, you know, know my worth as, as a woman, as, as a person. So mountaineering actually helped me because it was so uh, difficult for me, like physically, to endure all the pain on the mountain. That it helped me um, release my pain inside, and it just gave me strength, like mountain over mountain over mountain over mountain, and it just gave me the voice, voice to uh, speak up about like what I have been doing or what I could do for other people. And uh, it just, uh, it is something that gave me confidence and voice. And this is something I, I am trying to like translate into the other, other people, like, you know, be it uh, children or women or even men, you know, everybody. And um, yeah, there are like a lot of other <laughs> interesting, uh, uh, interesting parts also about mountaineering. Uh, like uh, there have been times when I had close calls, like I almost killed myself like on the mountain like a couple of times. But there have been times when I was uh, whether on the top or at certain point and I just I just felt like, oh, I'm, I'm the like, like maybe like king of the world or like in you know, a queen of the world. So <laughs> this sense of feeling of like triumph and uh, also like a pain and uh, all these like uh, ups and downs. Uh, it's a uh, quite a roller coaster, but uh, at the end of the day, it is something that has made me a better person and a stronger person, uh, I believe. Hi, Susanika. Nice to meet you. Hello, namaste. Namaste. Um, I, I'm a colleague of uh, Deepish's from uh, Nepal Ireland Society and the Ireland Nepal Chamber of Commerce. Um, I've been to Nepal myself a few times and I haven't done Island Peak, but I did do um, uh, Labuje and did Everest Base Camp. <laughs> So uh, but don't think I experienced any of the hardships uh, that you did on, on the higher mountains, but I'm, I, 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 you blew me away when you said uh, at the start that you were physically stopped from summiting Everest on your first journey there. What, I know you said it was because you were new Ari and you weren't Sherpa, but I mean, why, who was it stopped you? Was it a Sherpa guide? Or what was their uh, reasoning for stopping you, other than the fact that you were Niwari? What, what was, what was, why were they doing it, or what benefit was it to them to stop you? Uh, as I said earlier, as well, uh, it was more about like it was less about being um, Sherpa or not Sherpa or being Niwari, but it was more about the competition between two Niwari women because the same day at the same time another Niwari woman made to the top and got married on top of Everest and became the first Niwari woman to climb Everest. So it was more about the competition, which I uh, eventually found out like as I as I gradually went down to base camp and then Kathmandu and yeah that was the story. 
It's but but these, these, things, these are the things that helps you to, you know, uh, do even better things, you know, do much better and much bigger uh, things in life. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's incredible that, you know, there can even be politics on top of Mount Everest. Um, but I, I take your point. I mean, it has obviously inspired you to go on and overcome not just what happened on, on Everest, but obviously what had happened in your earlier life as well. Um, it's, it's an inspirational story and, and I commend you for what you've been able to achieve. So well done. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, also, um, till, till 2003, I never thought that I could climb mountain, <laughs> mountains or I never dreamed about it. I had read about Pasang Lamu uh, Sherpa. Uh, I had uh, seen the news uh, on television when she uh, climbed the mountain or I had uh, read about uh, Tenjing Norge and uh, all other mountaineers, but I never thought I would become a climber. But as a child, I always loved to climb uh, higher places. I, I loved uh, watching things from the height, you know, when I was in, in certain, in, in Kathmandu, we don't have a tall buildings, like maybe four or five, fifth storage, uh, when we were a child, yeah, fifth storage uh, houses were quite tall for us. And when I looked from the tall building, like, and, and everything looked tiny, I, I felt this kind of like uh, Gulliver kind of feeling, you know, and it, it just made me excited. And uh, in 2003, when I got chance to participate in one of the Nepal Mountaineering Association's, association's uh, training, uh, I got to go to Anupurna Base Camp. And uh, when I saw the mountain, I just knew it, that, I, OK, I, I would love to climb the mountain, and I'm born to do this. And it just kept going. It just I think like mountains uh, actually inspired me. Um, well, in Nepal, like, um, yeah, girls are often told, like, what they should do, what they shouldn't do, what they can do, and what they cannot do. I believe that uh, if you are, if you get education, like, most important thing for me uh, was education. And um, what I have achieved so far, like, beyond mountaineering is because of my education. So it's always an additional value. So if you are uh, educated enough, doesn't need to be like very high degree but if you are educated enough uh, then then you can you will be like able to decide what is good for you and what is not and what you can do and what you cannot you know so you yourself can decide so this pretty much helps to uh, shape up your dream and again uh, perseverance is is a key you know you cannot just um, think okay oh, i claim i will do this so you go there and you achieve it. it it doesn't happen that way for some people it does but not for all, everybody it takes a lot of perseverance a lot of hard work a lot of dedication for me to be uh, to do uh, all these seven summits it just took uh, it took me like almost 13 years and it wasn't like a day or, or a week or a month long uh, training or or dream or work you know hard work it was many many years uh, dedication so you just have to continue believing in your dreams and continue going on and you might uh, fail you might come back like five steps behind but then you have to try again and then again you you keep going and um uh, family support is also very important. I have seen a lot of people who have achieved certain places, but when because their family don't uh, support them, it just um, yeah, they don't see the worth. Uh, for me, uh, my my uh, family has been my biggest strength, so it has helped me a lot. 
And if uh, any girl in, in Nepal or uh, other parts of the world, if they want to do a mountaineering, just uh, don't do uh, like the way I said in 2008 when we uh, <laughs> brought like eight novice climbers on the mountain, because when you are not experienced, when, when you are not trained enough and when you are not experienced enough, you don't only put your life on risk, but also other people's lives on risk. So uh, for me, when I... Did my, even uh, when I did my first uh, Mount Everest expedition in 2005, I had already done four uh, formal mountaineering training and I had already climbed a couple of uh, peaks. So uh, you have to be well trained uh, to do the mountaineering or any kind of adventure sports. You have to be well trained or trained enough. So that's uh, that's uh, that's my suggestion for the girls who want to pursue mountaineering or adventure sports. And uh, believe me, like yeah, uh, it's, it's something I, I love to say. Uh, if I can do it, like everybody can do it. But yeah, you need a lot of hard work and perseverance and yeah, dedication. Yeah, I have uh, I have two actually. Um, you're <clears throat> you're living in Switzerland now. Um, I presume you're not near the mountains. Maybe you are. Would you like to see your children um, taking up mountaineering in the future? Oh, absolutely. We live uh, nearby Luzern, so we are near to Swiss Alps. So every morning we see sunrises uh, like over the Swiss Alps. And uh, this is something we want to uh, give to our children because my, my husband is a doctor, but he is also a very good snowboarder. And uh, we plan to start their, uh, start their uh, mount, uh, like not exactly mountaining, but a lot of hiking uh, from the summer and also uh, snow activities in the winter. Well, in fact, uh, we took our son um, to uh, having uh, almost to 3,000 meters, like like not almost to the part of uh, northern Gorka. You know, we took uh, took him on our um, bag, like like baby carrier. Uh, when he was just five months old. <laughs> so we do a lot of uh, hiking with the children and uh, definitely uh, we, will, we would love uh, our children to uh, take uh, mountaining or any career, whatever they wish uh, in future. Uh, that also makes me think that like maybe I might act like my mother because when I, uh, when I do, my, do mountaining, my mother gets really, really worried for my safety and maybe I might do the same <laughs> or I might be helping them fix the rope yeah. I don't know but yeah that is something we want to uh, we want to expose them to and uh, we will see if they like it then they can continue yeah I have I have two boys as well who I would have always brought hiking um, they don't do much now but what you could what we do is we put the seed in their mind and hope that they'll come back to it at a later stage when they get older um, my second question is, um, with regard to all the problems on Everest at the minute and the, the queues and the traffic jams and the deaths and all of that, I mean, you rightly pointed out earlier on, when you're on the mountain, you should be able to be responsible for yourself, because obviously, if you're not, you're putting others in danger. Um, do you think uh, it's the right thing to do that um, any prospective uh, climber for the 8,000 meter peaks should have a build up of uh, you know 6,000 7,000 meter mountains and proper uh, qualified mountaineering experience be before they try to take on Everest because there are a lot of novices so to speak who just do a crash course in mountaineering and uh, feel then that they're ready to go out on the mountain but when things go wrong then they're relying on their Sherpa guides and obviously putting them at risk then What's your opinion on that? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. One needs to have like at least um, basic basic um, um, level or like advanced level of mountaineering uh, courses, you know, and uh, the person should, should be, uh, actually, I think it is in the uh, criteria, you know, regulations uh, from uh, mountaineering uh, department or mountaineering board that like one should have a couple of peaks uh, done uh, in a, uh, ahead of Ma Mount Everest. It wasn't uh, before, but now I think there is a rule. 
this not only uh, helps other climbers on the mountain, but uh, the person uh, himself or herself as well, because uh, you cannot be like uh, people all, these days people like everybody says like okay mount everest it has become a tourist destination rather you know <laughs> um extreme adventure so a lot of people uh, com de depend completely upon their sherpas like to be like dragged up to the mountain or dragged down to uh, down safely to base camp there are a lot of uh, climbers like that and uh, definitely they should they should be well trained uh, not only physically but also mentally uh, and emotionally because there have been a lot of people who uh, just just break down you know on the mountain and uh, there's a point where they cannot just go go ahead um, so it's uh, to climb Everest you have to be like physically fit uh, well trained and well informed about the mountain and, and the risk. Uh, at the same time, you have to be like um, financially also uh, well sound and emotionally, mentally stable. Uh, these are all the things you need to do. And uh, these days, there are a lot of uh, good gadgets also for your safety. And uh, as a climber, I myself like because mountaineering is already a uh, a job or, or, a, or a field where it has so much of, of expected and unexpected um, risk factors, you know. So I like to climb it with minimized uh, uh, risk. So uh, that's, that's also one reason I, I climb with oxygen on Everest. So always I'm always on oxygen uh, above 7,500 meters. And uh, but uh, for other 7,000 meters, uh, I don't use oxygen. But there are a lot of climbers who don't use oxygen in uh, above 8,000 meters as well. But I'm I'm kind of person like also when I am climbing, I make sure that I am well fastened uh, on the rope or I am well harnessed and I am uh, taking all the safety measures and precautions while I'm climbing up or climbing down. But at the same, but. Having said that, also there are like a lot of times when weather doesn't um, go as you plan, you know, and then you uh, get into the problem. Like in 2011, when I was climbing Amadablam, I had a very good experience uh, experiences of uh, uh, mountains earlier, and we had a very nice team a team of 10, 10 uh, professional climbers. Um, but we had to climb really late as we were coinciding our summit uh, with the inauguration of uh, Nepal Tourism Year. And uh, we made to the top, uh, some, some of us made to the top like um, around uh, late afternoon, 4, 4.30, like I reached there 4, 4, 4.30. And when we were coming down, it was really, really late and it was super windy. Amadablam in winter is really, really uh, technical, you know, super windy and cold. And there was a point where I got trapped in the bad weather and uh, there were the two of the members were sick. So one uh, was accompanied by some of our climbers uh, downhill and a few were behind me, you know, helping another uh, climber, another of our team member who was sick. And my uh, my friend said, like, okay, Susmita, you are strong enough, you can climb down yourself. And I was like, okay, I will do it. And then one point I was just all by myself. It was pitch dark and super, super windy. And I am very thin, you know, because so I get hypothermic very easily. And at one point I was just like continuously hit by the wind and I was like holding the rope facing the ice wall and crying and praying to the God that just <laughs> stop the wind, you know. And then it was like, okay, I, I, I couldn't move my fingers. Uh, my ropes had all entangled and my toes were not moving. I couldn't uh, move my face and I could see my uh, the tip of my nose or lips and they were all uh, black and blue. And I was just crying and thinking about my family. And I was like, okay, like praying like, okay, maybe if somebody comes for rescue today, then maybe I would, you know, like, even if uh, somebody comes, then maybe I will have to lose my fingers and toes uh, because of frostbite, or I might just die here. And I was thinking of my family and crying, and I'm like, okay, what have I done? Like, why am I here on the mountain? You know, <laughs> why am I not in in Kathmandu with my family? They love me so much. And I was crying, and and one point I, I thought, like, okay, if I 
the, if I don't save myself, then nobody will. There is no superhero coming from outside. It has to be within yourself, you know. So I did something I had never done, and it took so much courage to do it. I screamed for help. I literally screamed like "batao, batao," and that was like I never did it. Like, you know, like who does it? You know, <laughs> we are not used to saying these words. You know, like I, I screamed like "batao, batao," help, help, and uh, two of the client, uh, two of our team members who were just. Uh, speeding downhill, you know, they they turn around and I could see two turret lights, you know, like facing like like I was like right up there and from down below like two lights, they turned towards me. And at that point I realized okay, people have heard me and they will come to help me. And that just gave me so much strength. And then I just started clearing the rope and I started climbing down as fast as possible until I made these two climbers, you know, they were my friends like uh, Nima and uh, Ming Magyalze. Uh, Ming Magyalze actually did a K2 winter expedition uh, recently. So um, these two friends, when I met them, like it was like, okay, that was the... I was so grateful to them that they waited for me, you know, and, and we climbed down together. I, it was super, super windy. We lost the way. We couldn't find the camp uh, until the morning, you know. It was diff very difficult. So sometimes uh, the weather, sometimes the situation puts you in, in a place where you cannot do anything. But if you are trained, you know, uh, the point is that because I was, uh, I was uh, very... Uh, well trained in mountaineering and well informed as well. So, and my my willpower is also very strong. So that helped me to save myself that day. Otherwise, I would have been killed on the mountain. You know. So uh, that's something. Yeah, people have to have like like very strong uh, willpower and uh, um, yeah, of course uh, the the training the training is very important as well. Yeah. No. I Okay, to be honest, uh, we, we just uh, moved uh, from January this year yeah, to Switzerland. Before that, we were in Germany. And um, in Switzerland, like already so many people, uh, it is quite unbelievable. But my, my husband tells me that like uh, out of like five, uh, five, six patients of his, at least one has already visited Nepal. So uh, I think Nepal is uh, quite uh, known to uh, Swiss people. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to, like, I haven't uh, yet met uh, Swiss people because of corona restriction also. We cannot, uh, we have uh, this lockdown period going on till end of this month. So we, we haven't actually interacted uh, physically with uh, any um, mountaineering community here. Which, uh, but but this, is, uh, this is my plan also for coming days. Um, we can do the part of uh, promoting um, mountaineering or tourism uh, here in Switzerland, you know, for the Europeans. But at the same time, I think I think uh, the government of Nepal or the the tourism uh, tourism um, department or tourism ministry or uh, the whole uh, tourism sector should also focus on the um, uh, infrastructures and uh, services to give it give to the mountaineers or tourists in Nepal because I have seen a lot of mountaineers or a lot of trekkers um, face a lot of problems when they are there. You know, they 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 get attracted, they go there and then they um, are in a lot of trouble and it's um, 
because of the lack of infrastructures or facilities or regulations, you know, or rescue um, services. So there, there are like these two parts should go parallelly, I believe. Uh, in in coming days, um, yeah, definitely. Like I, I'm gonna be, um, yeah, gonna be associated with uh, some of the uh, mountaineering associations or uh, the communities here, and we will see what uh, we can do uh, further with that. And I think uh, there are a lot of uh, mountaineering and sweet, uh, 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 ice skiing courses uh, done collaboration. There are a lot of collaboration done by uh, Swiss uh, Alpine clubs and Nepal mountaineering uh, um, organization, I think. So uh, they, yeah, there is a good chance of uh, promoting mountaineering here. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Namaste.